please welcome Joy Dunn. <laughs> All right, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Joy Dunn, and I'm the head of manufacturing for Commonwealth Fusion Systems. If there's one theme that's carried throughout my entire life, it's that I like to build things. From model rockets to Legos and literally anything I could get my hands on, I was always building things. And also at a young age, I became an immense space geek. At the age of seven, I got this signed photo from Sally Ride, and it said, to Joy, reach for the stars. I knew at that point that I wanted to be an astronaut, just like Sally. I took that inspiration with me to space camp twice, <laughs> and also to MIT, where I majored in aerospace engineering. In, uh, before my last semester at MIT, I interned at SpaceX in the summer of 2008. During that summer, I watched the third failure in a row of our smaller Falcon 1 rocket. And while that was devastating for the company, I watched the employees' resilience and their determination to try again and, and aim for Flight 4. During my last semester at MIT, Flight 4 was a, was a success, so that I was really glad that I had a company to, to come back to. <laughs> when I started full-time, I was a propulsion development engineer working on the Draco thrusters, which you can see here firing in space. This was an absolutely incredible feeling to see hardware that I had built flying in space at the ripe old age of 24. From there, I switched over to the manufacturing engineering team, uh, where I quickly progressed from a lead to a manager and then the senior manager of the Dragon Manufacturing Integration Team. I ran a team of about 70 engineers building every part of the spacecraft that you can see up here. In that time, I was also responsible for building out 150,000 square feet of production space, which we named the Dragon Hatchery and also Dragon's Lair. <laughs> that allowed us to increase the production capacity for the entire company from two to six spacecraft a year. So in my 10 years at SpaceX, what were some of the key lessons and takeaways that I learned? The first is to start small and iterate quickly. When SpaceX started, we were not the behemoth company that they are today. We started with that first, that small Falcon 1 rocket in a tiny hangar in El Segundo, California. Uh, this was a good test bed for testing out the Merlin engines, the welding techniques for the, uh, the structural tanks, and how everything operated as a whole system. Once we dialed that in and flight four and five were, were a success, we then scaled up to the Falcon 9 rocket. And that picture on the right is what the factory looks like today. Now, this didn't come easy. Uh, we had to follow our mantra of uh, be smart and scrappy. So this allowed us, uh, again, to iterate quickly, to try things that worked, and to never get stuck in, in the status quo. When I started at SpaceX, we were launching one rocket every year. And when I left, we were launching a rocket at a max of every two weeks. In the 10 years that I was there, we launched 65 rockets of the 65 Falcon 9 rockets and also debuted the Falcon Heavy rocket. Another key takeaway from SpaceX is to always challenge the status quo. What do the laws of physics and not historical precedent tell you is possible? When we decided to land rockets back from space, people thought we were crazy. Uh, but we said, the laws of physics say it's possible, so let's give it a try. We added on the landing legs and the grid fins, which you can see at the very top of this rocket, and tried many, many times to get this right. <laughs> After we nailed down the guidance, navigation, and control algorithms, we had our first successful landing back in December of 2015. In the four years since, SpaceX has landed 44 rockets back from space, 26 of which they've already reflown. In those four years, that saved the company over $750 million. And now other companies are following suit. It almost seems crazy not to be landing rockets back from space. Another key lesson learned is to always innovate. Uh, SpaceX started, again, with that very small Falcon 1 rocket, which you can see on the far right of this picture, uh, and then has since scaled up uh, by, but what, by what Elon calls an order of magnitude. So we want to make sure that we're not just iterating slowly, uh, bit by bit, and doing just a little bit better, th better than our competitors. It's like, how do we beat out the market? How do we do 10x better than our competitors? Uh, so that has led to uh, the many launches of the Falcon 9 rocket, which I mentioned, and then also the development of the Mars vehicle. Uh, so right next to the Falcon 1 rocket is, uh, is the Starship prototype. So uh, they just completed a hop test to 500 feet in the air uh, just a month ago, and are now planning on doing a suborbital launch of this Starship vehicle in just a few months. Uh, and then from there, uh, the goal is to colonize Mars. So, <laughs> if, but if I, look at, if I look at everything that SpaceX did in the 10 years that I was there, when Elon says he's getting to Mars in the next 10, I believe him. 
So if I had arguably one of the coolest jobs on the planet, why did I decide to switch? Now, if you read the news, it's impossible to ignore our existing global warming crisis. And this was something that I wanted to solve. It was important for me to fix up this current planet before focusing on getting off of it. If you look at these two pictures, you might think that the picture on the left is Earth. It's actually Mars. This is Elon's concept for terraforming Mars, which is thousands of years away. The picture on the right is where we're headed on Earth with our ever-increasing uh, global emissions, our global carbon emissions. That, to me, is a problem that we need to solve now, um, and that is why I joined CFS. So you may be wondering, what in the world is fusion? <laughs> Uh, so fusion is a type of energy that powers the stars, including the sun, and it's actually the exact opposite of nuclear fission. So fission takes some of the heaviest atoms on the periodic table, like uranium, splits them apart, and then that leads to a chain reaction, which could lead to devastating effects. Fusion is the exact opposite, where it takes the lightest elements on the periodic table, hydrogen, and we take two different isotopes of that, fuse them together inside a reactor, which we call a tokamak, and then that spits out helium and a ton of energy. We capture that energy uh, in the form of heat. That is run through a steam generator, and then that generates electricity. So why is this important? So I mentioned the ever-impending uh, global warming crisis, uh, but we're also continu we continue to need more and more energy around the entire world. Our energy demand right now uh, more than exceeds the amount of energy that we can produce in just a short couple of decades. So in order to solve this problem with clean energy, we need more than wind and solar. There are places where the wind does not blow and places where the sun does not always shine. Fusion is a, in an abundant energy source that can operate at any time of day and can provide the energy that we need to meet the ever-growing uh, ever demand for energy in the world. And since this is the Tough Tech Summit, think about all of the incredible things that you could solve in Tough Tech if you had unlimited energy and you didn't feel bad about where it came from. So fusion as a science has been around for decades, uh, but it's mainly been run by governments and academic institutions. Fusion as a science has been around uh, since about the 1960s, and developments in fusion from the 1970s to the 1990s actually exceeded Moore's law until it stagnated about two decades ago. Uh, it stagnated because of a limitation on industrial building materials and also with new, uh, with new material research, research on superconductors. So the two paths that the fusion community has taken, uh, specifically focusing on the tokamak reactor, uh, is one to build this giant reactor called ITER, which is being built uh, in France. If you can see on the very bottom left of that picture, uh, I've circled in red, that's a person for scale. Uh, so this reactor uh, requires 12 nations and $50 billion to produce net energy from fusion. And their goal is to have that operational by sometime in the 2030s. CFS is taking the opposite approach using uh, new superconducting material that's now uh, approaching commercial viability, and we are building much stronger magnets in a much smaller area. This allows us, as a small startup company, to build a fusion reactor that generates net fusion by 2025 at 1% of the cost of ITER. So CFS, like SpaceX, is starting small and iterating quickly. My team at CFS is building the first superconducting magnet, which you can see here on the far left. This magnet will be built and tested in the next year and a half and tackles and proves out the largest technical risk for our project. Once we've completed that, my team will then scale up to build 18 of these magnets for the spark reactor, which you can see in the middle. This reactor will be, will be the demonstration reactor that will show the first net energy from fusion by 2025. With that proven, we'll scale up from spark to arc, which you can see on the far left, or sorry, far right. Uh, so this is similar to the way that SpaceX scaled up from the Falcon 1 to the Falcon 9 or to the Falcon Heavy. Uh, and this will be actually a power plant that will plug directly into the electric grid. This reactor will produce 100 to 200 megawatts of power uh, and would replace a coal, coal power plant anywhere in the world. After we've proven this technology, we then scale up to many, many arcs uh, in the number of thousands around the world, and we're providing uh, clean, abundant energy for the world. So uh, CFS, um, again, like SpaceX, is an inspirational, mission-driven company, and that is why I work there. I work there because we as a team believe that access to clean, abundant, affordable energy and preserving the environment for future generations are fundamental human rights. Thank you.